You may be seated. Thank you for standing. So, I've actually missed the last three weeks. The joy of being at school in America is that you get to listen to Brother Trimble preach for two weeks and then, you know, spend another day just travelling and eight hours at Houston Airport, which is great. Um, but I know we've been teaching about salvation and learning about salvation, and this is the fourth lesson in this series on salvation. So we've established a few things so far. We've established that everybody needs to be saved. We've established that salvation is provided by grace, that we access that by faith, and that first action of faith is repentance, turning away from sin. Genuine repentance is the beginning of our new birth, our, our uh, process of being born again. And then last week we discovered that we must be baptized by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ to have our sins washed away. So, did I push that? Oh, thanks. Oh. <laughs> click, click. Right. Oh. <laughs> this is new to me. Sorry. <laughs> and while I'm used to having a title slide, I'm not used to having something to click through because, you know, teaching's normally done out there. Um, we're enjoying the new process. <laughs> so we must be born again. And so what we're learning about today is the Holy Spirit. So in John chapter 4 and verse 24, oh, I keep pushing buttons and locking it and stuff. In John chapter 4 verse 24, Jesus is speaking and he says, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what is a spirit? Well, as people, we're made of flesh, the bits that we can touch, and spirit, the bits that we can't touch. But we understand that we have our personalities and we have who we are, and that's our spirit. But God is a spiritual being. He is only spirit. So when we're talking about the spirit of God, we're talking about God. In, when, when we look at each other, we can see each other. We have that connection. We can see each other. But we can't see God because God is a spirit. And in Exodus chapter 33, how did we do this? John 4, 24, Exodus 33. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, and I know what's on the screen, but I always like looking up my Bible. So I'm going to look it up and you can read the screen. The screen is going to be New King James Version, but I'm actually reading from my Bible and it's the King James Version, but... They're very similar. In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 20, it says, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And then back in John, we were just in John chapter 4 verse 24, back in John chapter 1, John is the fourth book of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 1 and verse 18 says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now, unlike every other being, God is omnipresent. God, that means God is everywhere. God is also omniscient. God is all-knowing. So there's a whole bunch of things that God is that we're not. But God is everywhere. And when Solomon, when David said, I want to build a temple, and Solomon was built, going through the process of building a temple... God said, how will you contain me in a building? The heavens are my, are my throne, the earth is my footstool, a building's not going to contain me. Because God is everywhere. And in Acts chapter 7, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, so the very next book, just a couple of, a few pages over. Acts chapter 7, verse 48 and verse 49. And this is Stephen preaching. And he says... In verse, starting in verse 48. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? And so we understand the Bible explains that God is everywhere. God is huge. God is a spirit. So we can't see God because he is invisible. But he is 
everywhere. So we talk about God, we talk about the Spirit. God is holy. He is a Holy Spirit. And so when we look in the Bible and we see Holy Spirit, it is God. When we talk about the Holy Spirit being part of our lives, we're talking about God being in action. So Holy Spirit, God, same thing. There's one God. We understand that. Uh, His name is Jesus. We understand that. So God is holy, the Holy Spirit. But when we're talking about how the Holy Spirit works in our lives, we're talking about God in action in our lives. And we see in, in this church where we're blessed while I was away, I was talking to some other pastors about um, the gifts of the Spirit in their churches. And um, one of the pastors said, oh, yeah, no, we, we see tongues and interpretation, oh, three, four times a year. And I looked at him and went, really? I said, oh, we, if we go three weeks without seeing a tongue and interpretation, there's something wrong in our church, like... It just, we, we see the gifts in operation. That's just there all the time. Um, but the, and we talk about spiritual gifts. They're the gifts of the Spirit. They're God's given gifts to the church issued by His Spirit, issued by Him to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. We'll start at verse 11 and then go down to verse Oh, we're going to get there. Excellent. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, and it says, But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So there's one spirit that unites us as a church, as a body of believers, whether we're here in Lynbrook or whether I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, there's one spirit that unites us. And it's the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus Christ himself uniting us as a body of believers. So we need to understand that the spirit of God that is poured out into our lives is what we call the Holy Spirit. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Paul says in, to the believers in Ephesians, uh, in Ephesus, sorry, and he says to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And that's that, have you got the Holy Spirit operational in your life? Because if you've repented, you believe in God. You believe in the Holy Spirit because you've repented, you've turned toward Him. So we understand that, but we need the Holy Spirit working in our lives. We need to understand that there is only that one spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, so Galatians, then Ephesians. So we're in Corinthians, Galatians, then Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4. And it says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So there's one Spirit. So when we're talking about God, is the Holy Spirit God? The answer to that question is, yes, I've got a whole list of scriptures here that I probably won't take the time to look up each one individually. But in Matthew chapter 3.16, it talks about the Spirit of God. In Matthew chapter 1, 18, it talks about the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8, 39, it talks about the Spirit of the Lord. In John 14, 26, Jesus says, the Comforter, talking about the Holy Spirit. In John 16, 13, he talks about the Spirit of truth. And so we can actually see, if we, if we look in our lives, we can see when the Spirit has given us comfort. We can see when the Spirit has shown us truth. We can understand when the Spirit says this is holy and this is unholy. We can see these things each working in our lives at various points. It's the Spirit of Christ in Romans 8 and 9. 
It's the spirit of grace in Hebrews 10 and 29. And we understand we access salvation by grace. And it's the spirit of grace, God's spirit, that allows us access to himself. God makes the way for us. And it's not by works that we have done. But it's because we, it's because we understand God is holy where we realize God is holy and I'm not. Well, how do I change that? Well, I have to turn from my sin. I have to repent and I have to walk towards God. How do I pay for the sins that I've committed? What do I do to, to make myself clean? I'm baptized in the name of Jesus to wash away my sins. That makes me clean. That's the payment for my sins. And then I'm filled with the Holy Spirit to allow me to continue on in God. So in Hebrews 9.14, it talks about the eternal spirit. So that's who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is God. So if I'm saying Holy Spirit, if I'm saying God, they're interchangeable. Same, same. We need to receive the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. We need it for salvation and we need it to stay saved. Without the Holy Spirit, we are none of His. In Joel chapter 2, Old Testament, Joel chapter 2, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. I had to do that because I couldn't remember where it fitted. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29 says, and we're looking in Joel. Now, Joel is what, what is considered a minor prophet. So he, it's a small book um, of the prophets. But the minor prophets said a lot of really, really, really good stuff. And so they're minor because it's a small book. They're not minor because they didn't say anything interesting. In Joel chapter 2, and verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And so God makes this promise that his spirit is going to be poured out on all flesh. He makes this declaration and we can therefore expect it. And certainly in Acts chapter 2, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, the Apostle Peter is, they've received the Holy Spirit and people are questioning what is happening. So the the People in the upper room, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, but the people in the upper room have received the Holy Spirit. They've heard the sound of a wind. They've um, seen fire on each person's heads. And they've started speaking in languages that they've never learnt and don't understand. And they're clearly quite excited about this. And so they end up not in the upper room anymore and they're out sort of outside and the people around the city are going, what's happening? Why are you all being odd? And they actually say, oh, are you drunk? Like, it's, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Why aren't you sober? You're acting in such a strange manner. And so the Apostle Peter gets up and he starts to speak. And the Apostle Peter refers back to the, the book of Joel. And so in Acts chapter 2, verse 16... Peter says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Something that I find interesting is we often... You often see prophecy or whatever, and it's very masculine. And it's the man, the man, the man. And God is not just focused on men, but often you'll find Old Testament is man, man, man. But this particular prophecy, God makes it clear that it's men and women. And sometimes we can be very focused on, well, I have to be a certain age. And, and this prophecy is for old and young. 
So what, and, and then it goes on to say further, all flesh. So we can sometimes say, well, God, you have to move in this box. This is where you fit. And this is what I'm going to allow you to do. But what God is saying is I want to pour myself out on all flesh. I want to be poured out on men, on women, on young people, on old people. I want to be poured out on everybody. I want my spirit to be alive in everybody's life. Jesus, Jesus was God in flesh. And that's a great mystery. And how does that work? I don't have the science for it. But I know that God put on humanity. And he walked among us. And he healed people. And he ministered to people. And he cast demons out of people. And then he went to a cross and died for my sins. And so this flesh, God in flesh, this flesh went to a cross and died. And his blood was shed. And the Bible says by his stripes we're healed. But it's by his blood that the price of sin is paid. And we see that in baptism. But while Jesus walked this earth, he talked about the spirit. And that we would, when, when he left, because his body died and he ascended into heaven, um, after he was resurrected, ascended into heaven, then he, the spirit of Christ, as it says in Romans, came back as the comforter. And in John chapter 3, John chapter 3 and verse 5. So Jesus is often talking about the Spirit and what the Spirit will do and what the Spirit can do. John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus talks about being born again. And he's talking to an older man. And this whole story is quite interesting and if you you can go into all the details of it and you can study it and you can discover what all the words mean and Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says you must be born again and Nicodemus goes uh I think you're talking something spiritual but that can't be right so let's talk about being born again and me going back into my mother's womb when I'm an old man and Jesus says, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. And in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So we need the Holy Spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, you need the Holy Spirit. You need to be born of the Spirit. And if you're at church this morning... It means you have a desire for God. And it probably means you want to enter the kingdom of God. And so if that's your desire, then you need the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 7, verse 37, John chapter 7 and verse 37, and this is Jesus again speaking. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus is saying, Come unto me and drink. If you're thirsty, I will give you living water. And then John says, but it wasn't available yet because Jesus hadn't died and gone into heaven. And so if you are thirsty, if your soul is thirsty today, then the living water, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, God himself can come and satisfy the thirsting in your soul. And we're people. And as people... We have expectations. My life's going to look like this. This is how things are going to work. This is how things are going to be. And we try to fulfill that thirst with a career. We try to fulfill that thirst with um, activity, sport. We try to fulfill that thirst with alcohol, with drugs. We try to fulfill that thirst with a 
partner or multiple partners, we always look for a way to fulfill that thirst, that longing, that desire. I need fulfillment. Where can I get that? And we find it in the Holy Spirit. So if you're thirsty, you can have your thirst satisfied. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we receive the Holy Spirit, and what it does is it gives us power. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and this is Jesus talking again. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The Holy Spirit gives us power. And it's power to witness, to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ, but it's also power to overcome sin. So when we come to God, people are... When, when we come to God, we're changed. And I can talk to people at work and say, well, I used to do this, and I used to do that, and I used to do something else... And they'll be like, really? What happened? I'm like, well, I found Jesus. I, I gave my life to God. And that always surprises them. Because what they think they, what they, think they want to hear is, uh, I've got a strong self-will. Or I just changed how I behaved or whatever. But the thing that changed me was the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what changed me. That's what transformed my life. It wasn't that I went, woke up one morning and said, I'm not doing that anymore. It was the Spirit of God working in me that went, you know that that you've been doing? It doesn't satisfy. Right? Yeah, it doesn't. You don't want to do it anymore. No, I don't. So stop. But it's hard. How can I? And the Spirit of God in me goes, you can. I'm giving you power. And suddenly, the things that had me bound, the things that had me in their control were released because I had the power of Christ, the power of God in me. We will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon us. And then, because I'm transformed, I don't, I, I don't have to walk up to somebody and say, do you want to hear about Jesus? I don't have to ask that question because when they say, when I say, oh, well, I used to do that. I used to do that. What changed? They've asked me then and I can talk about Jesus because he's transformed my life. So we become transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost works. We need the Holy Ghost. We absolutely need the Holy Ghost for salvation. Jesus says, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you need the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. I'm not willing to argue with Jesus about that. If Jesus said it, then it's true. So I'm just going to say, you need the Holy Spirit for salvation. And that's as a, to experience the new birth. But you need the Holy Spirit each and every day of your life. The Holy Spirit protects, the Holy Spirit guides, the Holy Spirit helps, the Holy Spirit ministers, the Holy Spirit leads. And without the Holy Spirit, you'll struggle. And you, you can come to church without the Holy Spirit. You can come to church, you can feel Jesus, you can know Him, you can experience the love from the people in this church, you can belong here and, and feel a part of it. But without the Holy Spirit, you're going to go to work tomorrow or school tomorrow or wherever tomorrow and go, where is that? Where, where, where's that good feeling I had at church yesterday? But when the Holy Spirit is part of your life, that good feeling that you have at church is with you all the time. And so when you have a problem at work, I had a difficult situation at work on Friday, it's difficult going back to work after a 40-hour flight and jet-lagged, but I survived. But on Friday, I had a difficult situation, and one of my team members had, had um, not responded to an email, and the person had decided that that meant something that it 
didn't mean and I had to step in as the manager and say, well, let's talk through this through. And the person is getting more and more irate rather than calming down. And, um, and I could feel myself start to be like, well, how dare you talk about my staff member that way? That's just not right. And I went, Jesus, because he's there. And suddenly I was like, you know what? This is not about me. He's upset. That's okay. It's not about me. And I can go, God, you tell me what to do. You step into this situation. You be involved. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, I can say, God, I need you at work. And God's at work. He's with me. We can be out looking for a car park. God, I need you right now here for a car park. And there's a car park. Because the Holy Spirit is part of our lives. And so when we have the Holy Spirit as part of our lives, we, we, are, we become overcoming Christians. And it's more than just, oh, how am I going to get to Sunday? This is hard. And suddenly it's, this is all right. I know I've got trials. I know I've got problems. I know I've got situations. But God is with me. And we can draw strength from that. So we need the Holy Spirit. And we need it more than just on Sundays. So how do we know we have the Holy Spirit? How do you know that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you? How do you know that that is true? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, and we were talking about Acts chapter 2 a little earlier. This was the day of Pentecost. We might actually start at verse 1. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Unity matters. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. That would be exciting. The doors open. We could, you know... There's a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. That'd be cool. I've, I've experienced visions, but never one like that. That would be cool. Like in church and suddenly there's fire on everybody's heads. It'd be like, oh, what's happening? What's happening? And it would be wonderful, like, just to know that God is at work, to see that visually would be incredible. So they, they've heard this sound, they've seen this fire, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they've had these three things that have occurred. And the Holy Spirit, they begin to speak with other tongues. And... I love Acts chapter 2. I just, I, I really enjoy it. I, it's great. And in verse 12, Acts chapter 2 verse 12, and they were all amazed. This is everybody that's gathered around, all the people from the city. And they were all amazed and were in doubt. So they're, oh, this is amazing, but what's going on? Saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. And not every time, but when you get the Holy Ghost, you can be overcome with joy and be like, this is so exciting. And you're talking in tongues and you're, you're, you're excited. And if you're not a hugger, you might suddenly become a hugger. And, and people are like, what is going on there? I've seen it i've experienced it people can start to act drunk they can get the wobbles and the shakes and just kind of you'll see people fall over and these are things that happen when the holy spirit moves on us and so what what what's happened in this city in the city of jerusalem is that people have seen these things occurring and they've said are, are they drunk has a new pub opened up on that corner like what's what's going on and so they're seeing this, they're, they're seeing this um, experience. In Acts chapter 10, and that was the first time the Holy Spirit was poured out. In Acts chapter 10 and verse, uh, we'll pick it up at verse 44. 
So in Acts chapter 10 and verse... Sorry. Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. How, how, how do we know that? And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. Again, we've got a bit more amazement happening. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know? Verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So the speaking in tongues is how you know you've received the Holy Spirit. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Acts chapter 10, I love the whole Bible. Acts chapter 2 is great. Acts chapter 10 is great. Because Acts chapter 10 opened up the Holy Spirit's salvation to me. Before then it was Jews and Jews only. Acts chapter 10, suddenly I can receive the Holy Spirit. I can have an encounter with God. I can know who God is. I can have God working in my life. I can experience Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I can have my sins dealt with because Gentiles now receive the Holy Spirit. And the other thing that I like here is they're all so excited they got the Holy Ghost. Woo, they're excited and the Jews are astonished. And Peter's like, right, baptism now. And commanded them. Not this really polite, would you like to be baptized? It would be lovely. But no, no, now. He commanded them to be baptized. I just find that interesting. And in this, in, in, in Christianity today and in society today, we don't like commanding people to do, to do anything. Even police officers were like, mm, mm, not sure that I want to actually abide by that. Um, I got pulled over by an American police officer recently while I was in America. That was exciting. And um, it, was, it, it was exciting. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was driving down the road, five lane highway, and there's a police car pulled over in the side. And I went past him and I went, he's going to pull me over. I was doing the same speed as everybody else. I went, he's going to pull me over. I thought, that's weird. No. And he pulled out. I'm like, uh-oh. I had a, it was freezing that day. The cold change had just come in. It was freezing that day. I, the van was freezing. I had my hood up. So the hood's, hood's right up. I thought, no, no, take the hood down. <laughs> down came the hood. Because the thing is, like God, was, like, God told me that he was going to pull me over. It wasn't just me going, oh, that'd be fun. God told me he was going to pull me over. And God's like, take the hood down. I thought, yeah, all right, the hood down. And comes in behind me, and on go the lights. And in Australia, you pull to the left. In America, you pull to the right. So I pulled over to the right and pulled up, and I was fine. It was too much work trying to book an Australian. So he, that's what he said. He said, that there's a couple of citations there, but it's too much paperwork. So just get it dealt with. No worries, officer. Thank you very much. Um, but we, we sometimes push back against commands. You can't go here. I'm, I am prone to do not enter. I am prone to go, why not? That's, that's me. And, and my dad said to my wife one day as I was doing that, you married him. And Lolly said, no, you raised him. <laughs> but it's, it's, I'm prone to not follow commands. And, and you're probably prone to not follow commands either. And, but Peter commanded them to be baptised. I just find it interesting that that's what he did. In Acts chapter 19... And I, I spoke really briefly about um, the believers in Ephesus. And this is in Acts chapter 19. And in Acts chapter 19, and we'll start at verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So Paul arrives in Ephesus 
and he meets some people that are at church. And he's so pleased to meet other believers. And he says to them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Because that would be right. They're all at church. We should have the Holy Ghost. And they say, well, actually, we don't even know if there is a Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. John the Baptist, disciples of John the Baptist had gone around telling people, you need to repent. And they baptized them according to John's baptism, not according to baptism that Jesus was declaring, but according to John's baptism. So they've repented. These are good people. Good people. They're at church. They're doing their best to love God. They're doing their best to be everything they can be, but they haven't got the Holy Ghost and they weren't baptized right. Then Paul then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So they've believed on John, and all right, when when the Christ comes, we'll believe on him too. And so they've done those things. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. How do we know? And they spake with tongues and prophesied. So these three different times in the book of Acts, we see people receiving the Holy Spirit. The, same, the thing that's the same about each of them is they spoke with tongues. And so that's an experience that many people in this room have had. So you can't tell me, unfortunately, I've, received, I've had that experience. So you can't say to me, Daniel, that's not for today. You can't tell me that because I've experienced it. You could perhaps try to say, well, it's not for everybody. Look at the people in Ephesus. It wasn't for them. Well, it wasn't for them yet because they didn't know about it. But I'm here to tell you the good news today. You can have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You can have God set up camp inside your heart. You can have God come to live with you forever by receiving the Holy Spirit. You can have this experience. You can have this encounter. This is available to you. Whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're young, whether you're old, this is an experience that is available to you. And Jesus said, necessary if you want to enter the kingdom of God. So we need the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit helps us each and every day. We need the Holy Spirit for salvation, but we need the Holy Spirit to stay saved. It's not a once and done. You need it working in your life day by day. And the Holy Spirit helps us every day. It teaches us. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and directs us. It teaches us. The Holy Spirit empowers us. It gives us power. Power to overcome sin. Power, one of the fascinating things I find about this is it's power both to will and to do. And so when you go, I don't know if I can overcome my addiction. I don't know if I can overcome my bondage. I don't know if I can do those things. The Holy Spirit inside of us gives us the will, the desire to overcome those things. So things that we were bound by, things that we were oppressed by, things that had taken up root in our lives, the Holy Spirit gives us the power to go, I don't want to do that anymore. And they're not just the power to say, I don't want to do that, but the power to not do it or to start doing something that we should be doing. So we can often go, I'd love to read the Bible more. I'd love to spend more time in prayer. I'd love to be a better Christian. And the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do those things. To pick up the Bible and go, wow, this is interesting. Wow, I'm finding this exciting. Wow, I didn't realize that that person was that, that person was that person was, that, was their great, great grandfather. I didn't realize the whole Bible was connected. I didn't understand that this bit related to this bit. And if I've read this bit, I understand this bit. Wow, the Bible's interesting. The Holy Spirit allows that to happen. The Holy Spirit transforms your prayer time. Because suddenly, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit itself makes intercession for us. It transforms us. The Holy Spirit loves us. When we have the Holy Spirit, we can have that encounter. 
I think I'd been away from Australia too long. We were only gone for two weeks, but I think I was away too long. One of my classmates is a pastor in Canada. And lovely guy, like really sweet guy. He passes in the town next to Brother Woodward's town. And um, really lovely guy. And uh, I thought, I'll just check out his church website. And when you open up his website, the first thing that you see are the words, welcome home. And I think I'd been away from home too long because I went... (laughs) (laughs) Lolly's like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, the website says... And showed her the screen. But God loves us. And God can use... And I texted Brent straight away and I'm like, hey, love the website, love the opening page, that's great. Just, you know, he's like... It's just a work in progress. So it, I might have got the dodgy version. But <laughs> God loves us. And because God loves us, he'll use a dodgy website to minister to me and to let me know that he loves us. And we have the Holy Spirit. When we, when we have the Holy Spirit, we can have that encounter with God every single day. The Holy Spirit reminds us. The, Jesus said, Um, to his disciples, it'll bring all things to your remembrance. And so when we remember, when we live our lives, the Holy Spirit will go, you know that scripture you read a couple of weeks ago? And it'll bring it to your mind. You won't have realized that you've remembered it, but the Holy Spirit will remind you. You'll be out somewhere and the Holy Spirit will remind you, not that way, that way. You'll be headed towards something and the Holy Spirit will say to you, that used to be the path to this. You need to take a different path. The Holy Spirit will, will remind you. The Holy Spirit will remind you this is what you used to be, but look what you've become. So the Holy Spirit at work in your life every day will help you each and every day. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of resurrection. It will allow you to be lifted off this earth. When Jesus comes back, our hope, our future. When Jesus returns, it is the Holy Spirit that will allow us to be changed. We shall all be changed. And we can look forward to that because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit strengthens us. Probably should have tried that yesterday when I moved the piano. (laughs) I lift with my knees, Jason. Thank you. I did use my knees. My back is fine, but every muscle from my fingertips through to my ankles... And that is now in pain. But it's okay. I should hit the gym more. The Holy Spirit seals us. It says, this child is my child. It says, this one, devil, this one is mine. It seals us. Salvation is vital. Salvation is necessary. We As a church, our role, our job, our purpose is to seek and save the lost, to reveal to them salvation, that salvation is available to them and that they don't have to earn it, they don't have to buy it, they don't have to be good enough for it, but that salvation is available. We all need salvation. So how are we saved? Grace by faith. It's by grace. You can't earn it. You don't deserve salvation. I don't care how much money you give to the poor. I don't care what good deeds you do for your next door neighbors. that, That doesn't add up to anything. You don't earn salvation. It is a gift of God. You access grace by faith, repentance. God, I realize you're real. I realize that I'm not holy and you are. God, I'm turning from sin and I'm turning towards you. Repentance. You are baptized in Jesus' name to for the payment of your sins, to wash away your sins. You receive the Holy Spirit. This is the new birth. This is what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 3. You receive the Holy Spirit. That's how we're saved. And you're welcome at any time here in that process. Welcome here for that whole um, journey and that whole experience.